You are listening to the New Book of Daniel podcast. The nurse told me, Dr. Dopko, I know you're upset. I can understand why. Um, when you call the surge line, tell them that we have one COVID bed available at our hospital um, and that we'll be happy to take the patient. You've already done a doc to doc, so maybe they'll just patch you back through to us. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, hold it, wait. So because I'm calling the COVID line on a patient that I know doesn't have COVID, has no COVID symptoms, has his typical asthma, you're going to put him in a COVID unit. And she's like, yes, if it's coming from the COVID line, it will, it will go to a COVID unit. You are about to hear the full story of how exceedingly high-risk patients, extremely ill, but with absolutely no symptoms of COVID, are being sent to COVID units at hospitals on today's new book of Daniel podcast. Hello and welcome to the new book of Daniel podcast. My name is Daniel Bobinski. I'll be your host on this adventure. Today we have with us a returning guest, Dr. Joshua Dapko, an emergency room physician who uh, I stumbled upon on Facebook back in April. He had been kicked out of several uh, COVID chat groups because of his position on COVID and people accusing him of not being a real doctor. Uh, I did some investigation, found out that he was a real doctor, called him up, asked him if he'd like to be on the show. He agreed. And that podcast ended up being one of our most watched and listened to podcasts. I will put a link to that show down below in the show notes if you want to go watch that. Uh, but last week, uh, Dr. Dopko contacted me, said that he had uh, some new information. Would I like to hear about it? I said, definitely. So we spent about, I'm going to say, two, two and a half hours talking and recording that conversation this past week. And I'm not going to put up that whole long interview. We've uh, decided to break it up into chunks. In today's chunk, we're going to be talking about how hospitals are handling high-risk patients that are very susceptible to COVID. I think you're going to be uh, very shocked and very saddened at what you hear, uh, but I'm going to let Dr. Dopko tell that story. So let's go straight to our interview with Dr. Dopko. Dr. Dopko, thank you so much for uh, returning to our show, coming back on, and we're so glad to have you back. It's my pleasure to be back. When you contacted me earlier this week, you said you had some interesting news, and you told me about an asthma patient. And I'd like you to please share that story with our listeners. Yeah, so I had a gentleman that came in. He's well known to our area and to the nurses and physicians. He frequently comes in with asthma. Um, it's frequently quite severe. He's been in ICUs before. He's been intubated before. He came in for asthma um, several days ago. Came in with his classic presentation, classic asthma presentation. Um, he was quite ill and um, he was gonna need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, I called my hospital that I typically call to admit patients. I, I have a relationship with a hospital in a city that's nearby where I work. And I spoke with the physician that was on call and they wanted me to do a COVID test on him. Um, the gentleman didn't have any symptoms of COVID. He had just straight up asthma exacerbation. Um, so I'm like, sure, I'll test him for COVID. All of a sudden the transfer nurse that's on the line listening and coordinates our interaction. She's, she makes the statement, doctors, if, um, if you're requesting a COVID, test and you're doing a COVID test, then you need to call the Arizona surge line. And the, what Arizona, is that? the Arizona surge line, it's a, it's a hotline that has been put together by the um, Department of Health in Arizona that now basically becomes a broker between the rural hospitals that are trying to transfer patients and um, and hospitals that can accept them. So you call this line in Phoenix, Arizona, 
and they look and see who's next in line to take a COVID patient, who has bed availability, and then they farm that patient out to the hospital. So it takes away any choice I have as to what hospital I want to send the patient to. Um, I have an agency up in Phoenix that decides that. So I've had people transferred clear up to Kingman, Arizona, which just to put that in perspective, if you're driving, that's probably a seven and a half hour drive from where I live. It's, it's far enough of a, a trip by air to where somebody goes by helicopter, they need to stop twice and refuel on the way. Well, let's put the asthma conversation on hold for a second, if we can. Okay. And let's talk about this. You have to call a place and they decide where this patient's going to go. You said, you use, I think you used the phrase, who's next in line to receive a COVID patient? Correct. And I can, I can kind of tweak things a little bit. I can suggest, hey, the, we're down by Tucson. Can you please try to get us into Tucson? And they may try to give some preference to Tucson or Phoenix over these places on the other side of the state. But we've sent patients all over the state from where we are. I'm wondering... Even though there's a bed, you know there's a bed close by that can accept this patient, they're still going to decide that this patient goes somewhere else? Correct. It, it could go up to Phoenix. It could come down to Tucson. But they try to balance out the patients, not overwhelm any hospital system. Um, and so it, it can be quite a burden. It takes away all the choice out of medicine also. Um, typically, we try to honor patients requests. If they want to go to one hospital over another, um, we try to honor that. We can't always honor it, but we at least try to start with that. And also, this is the, the stuff that we're hearing out of New York when these patients are admitted into COVID units and they, they have no advocate. They have no family advocate uh, who can be there to consult with the doctor. The doctor is making unilateral choices on this person without consulting with any family members at all. Um, Correct. And I live in a very, I work in a very impoverished neighborhood. So there's some people that don't have vehicles. Um, some people who do have vehicles, but they're not good enough shape or they don't have the money to drive seven hours one way. And then if they do go up there, they're not going to be allowed to see their family member anyways. So why would you drive a vehicle that is questionable to begin with seven hours just to go get a report in a waiting room? You're not going to. This, this is what we can expect with socialized medicine? I imagine so. <laughs> yeah, there, there won't be very many personal choices on things. And we can do a whole podcast on, on my <laughs> transformation from when I was a socialist to supported socialized medicine as a physician and compare and contrast my beliefs about about patient care and end of life care and even beginning of life care, what I used to believe when I was a proponent for socialized medicine versus what I am now that I, I oppose it. That could be a whole, whole um, podcast in itself, I think. We should do that podcast. Do, do you know if um, hospitals are still receiving $13,000 for admitting a COVID patient? I haven't heard that that's been rescinded. I, don't, I wasn't able to find that out specifically. Hmm. So maybe, I mean, if you think about motivation, you, I suppose on the surface, you could say, we don't want hospitals to get overwhelmed, but why not send people out to various areas when a hospital starts to get overwhelmed instead of just going, well, who is next in line to receive the $13,000? That's because that's what it sounds like. Just that could very surface. well be. Yes. And, um, and I don't know if we were having trouble with doc hospitals turning down patients, but I, I never had any trouble getting patients anywhere at the beginning of this before the surge line went into, into effect. And not only that, it slows down the whole transfer process. So I have to make this phone call, then they have to search around for a bed, then they have to reach out to a hospital and give that information and then that hospital gets back to me. And so on an average, it's going to add at least an hour and a half to two hours of time it takes just to get this person transferred. And, you know, at the peak of our 
COVID um, hit in our hospital, we were seeing 20, probably 20 COVID patients, maybe 15 in a 24 hour day, um, which doesn't sound like a lot from somebody from the city, but when you're looking at the fact that um, before COVID, pre-COVID, we were seeing maybe 25 to 30 patients per day pre-COVID. Then once we hit the COVID scare, but we weren't seeing any COVID, our numbers dropped down to like four or five patients in a 24 hour day. It was financially killing our hospital. We had to send nurses home. We were cutting physician hours. Um, and then COVID finally got to our town. And then we went to seeing almost exclusively COVID. When it first hit, it was, we were seeing large numbers and we were seeing large number of sick people. And the irony of it is the surge line did not exist at that time. It was already starting to wane when the surge line came into, into existence. And you had no problem pacing, uh, placing patients then? Prior to that, no. And um, the first hospital you called might not be able to take the patient, but I don't think I ever had to call more than the second hospital. Hmm. And, and if I remember, if, if you remember when like swine flu came through the country, there were times where I was calling multiple hospitals all over the state to try to get patients. Wow. Place. Wow. And hospitals are full. Hospitals are full. And you're so, not having that now. No. By the way, for those, I'm going to interrupt you because I, I, you live in rural Arizona, right? I do. I, I personally live in a town of about 55, 60,000 people, but I work in a town that is 17,000 well, people. The reason I bring that up is because you're right. We can tell by looking at your camera that uh, you're sitting outside kind of a, a half, half, half kind of room and we're hearing the little it sounds like a little quail in the background so yeah i have amazing amounts of bird i've, I've started <laughs> a garden in my yard and put some fountains so we are just inundated with all kinds of birds i got finches and hummingbirds it's just amazing so i, I just want to let people know if they hear that little noise it's not it's not anything wrong with your speakers you are hearing quail <laughs> in the background dr dopko is uh, kind of in a patio room out here in Arizona. So that's what we're getting is nature. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> anyways, you were talking about, let's, let's go back to that patient. So, so you have this system now, this surge line that you have to call to place somebody uh, in a hospital. This, this patient is clearly an asthma patient. Correct. No signs no, of COVID whatsoever. No, chest x-ray does not look like COVID. Lab work doesn't look like COVID. Unfortunately, at our, my hospital, we don't have the rapid, um, rapid swab that can exclude COVID in 30, 45 minutes. We have to send ours off, and that takes 48 to 72 hours. So after I talk with this nurse, and she tells me that I have to go through the COVID line now, um, I was infuriated. I had already waited a couple hours to talk with this physician, just simply because of change of shift time. When I had called, it was right before another doctor was leaving. And so he had been very busy that day. So they asked if I could wait until this new physician came on. So I'd already waited about two hours. And the new physician was like, no, you need to, you need to do a COVID swab on this gentleman. And then it has to go through the surge line. So I was very frustrated. Um, this hospital is the one that I typically, is my go-to hospital. It's the hospital I would send my family to. And it's the one I preferentially send my patients to unless they request something else. Um, so the lady, the nurse told me, Dr. Dopko, I know you're upset. I can understand why. Um, when you call the surge line, tell them that we have one COVID bed available at our hospital um, and that we'll be happy to take the patient. You've already done a doc to doc, so maybe they'll just patch you back through to us. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, hold it, wait. So because I'm calling the COVID line on a patient that I know doesn't have COVID, has no COVID symptoms, has his typical asthma, you're going to put him in a COVID unit. And she's like, yes, if it's coming from the COVID line, it will it will go to a COVID unit. And so now we have a gentleman who has horrible lung disease. He's got a wife, he's got kids, he's a young guy. And 
he's already in a precarious situation to begin with. And, and you and know this guy. Go, yes. And he it, will go to a COVID unit. When, when you first talked to me about this on the phone, you said it was, this guy's almost like on a first name basis with your staff. He is. With like, I think you said same song verse 40. It is. He's in there all the time with asthma and has been coming in for years with this With problem. asthma, correct. And sometimes he gets tuned up in the um, emergency department and goes home. Sometimes he has to go to a regular floor bed. Sometimes he has to go to an ICU and he's even been um, intubated before. So he's got bad asthma. And that's what he came in with this day. And my response to him is, yeah, so you want me to send him to a unit where he'll get COVID and he will die. He's the type of person that if he got COVID, he would probably die from it. COVID is, has the potential to be a horrible killer. And certain people, if they get it, high, it is high risk, very, yeah. devast de very devastating. And he would have been one of them that, that would. And so this whole fiasco took so long that this gentleman began to feel better. Um, he was still not ready to be discharged to home, but it had taken so long that he felt so much better than when he came in, he made the decision to sign his, himself out against medical advice and he went home. So instead of going to, yes, instead of going to a COVID unit, he went home. And he probably saved his life. And so that was, then I was driving home that night. And as I was driving home, it reminded me of an older gentleman that I had seen probably about a week prior to this. This gentleman, he came in with a classic looking bacterial pneumonia on his chest x-ray. He had no exposures to COVID. He didn't have any of the other symptoms like diarrhea, loss of smell, loss of taste, headache, all of the other symptoms that they're that we're picking up on. He just had symptoms of a bacterial pneumonia. When you do a x-ray on a COVID patient, a lot of times they're gonna have bilateral pneumonias lower in their lower lungs. And this guy had a very isolated, well-defined consolidation or area of fluid in his right lower lung. That is a very common place for old men to get their pneumonia or old ladies. We don't want to discriminate, but um, that's a very common place for him to get a bacterial pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So once again, I call the hospital, same hospital. And I, I had told them, I had this guy, I think he's got bacterial pneumonia. Don't think he has COVID. And they're like, why don't you swab him? And I'm like, okay, we'll swab him. Well, you need to go through the surge line. No problem, we'll go through the surge line. And so I sent this old man with what I honestly believe was a bacterial pneumonia through the surge line, not even realizing that by doing so, he was going to be put on a COVID unit. I don't know what happened to that gentleman. I haven't heard or got any reports back, but um, it made, made my heart sink when I realized and put two to two together on that asthma patient and this patient with bacterial pneumonia. It never even crossed my mind that just because I called the COVID unit or the COVID line, that that was guaranteed automatic COVID this guy. Right. So just because someone requests a swab, that requires it then to go through the surge line. Correct. And I've since, as, um, I'm very vocal, you know, most physicians aren't talking about this kind of stuff and, and I'm very vocal on social media about things. And, and I've had ICU nurses that are in charge of ICUs up in Phoenix, um, kind of rebuke me on my stance on this. And of course he was going to go to a COVID bed. Any respiratory patient's going to go to a COVID bed. Any patient that needs the ICU is going to go to a COVID bed if we can't exclude COVID. So the sicker you are, the more likely you, you're going to go to a bed unless they can do a rapid swab on you and confirm that you don't have COVID. Well, that was an interesting uh, conversation right there. And um, 
I'm kind of shocked at what I heard from that. And uh, I think perhaps if you were to contact some of your healthcare professionals in your state and start making some noise, we might be able to make a difference. We are in a war, I do believe, an information war. And it's a battle for what's going to happen to our healthcare system and our health in general and our society in general. If we don't speak up and start making some noise, uh, we're going to get bowled over by people who do not have our best interests in mind. They have their pocketbooks in mind. Anyways, uh, there's much more to hear about from Dr. Dopko and look forward to uh, uh, some more of those little chunk, these little chunks of, of our interview. To find out when we do that, uh, when those get posted, go ahead and subscribe to our show. And of course, if you want to uh, ping me and, and send an email, ask any kind of questions, you can send me an email to newbookofdaniel at outlook.com. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook, it's simply facebook.com slash newbookofdaniel. I'm also found on Twitter and Parler, both as at newbookofdaniel. And I have a blog that I occasionally uh, write some things at, uh, newbookofdaniel.com. Of course, you can always read my, my columns over at uncoverdc.com and also at Red State. Uh, so I do thank you for watching. Go ahead and subscribe to the show. And we will be in touch with you soon with our next installment with our interview with Dr. Jo Joshua Dobko. Until then, be blessed.